Welcome to episode 137. This episode of Silver Lining for Learning is on mental health, mindfulness, and the movement towards social emotional learning. And Dana Hendrickson from Arizona State will be joining us, an associate professor there, and Natalie Gruber, one of her students who's about two months or less away from defending her dissertation, is going to lead us into some mindfulness examples and meditation here in a second or two. And Sean, Sean Hannafin is at Crockett or David Crockett Elementary School in the Phoenix, which has been implementing some creativity in their curriculum, quite a bit, in fact, and uh, some mindfulness. mindfulness as well. And Dana and Natalie and their colleagues have been publishing every month, pretty much, in Tech Trends about creativity. And I've been reading it. I'm sure all of you who are watching this show have seen her name somewhere, trying to figure out where you've seen it. Lo and behold, go to the, any issue of Tech Trends, and probably the opening article of that is an interview of a creativity expert or a comment about creativity or what you can do in terms of creativity in the curriculum. That's why I was, I'm was i thinking, you know, um, Sean has been implementing creativity, but of course, it's mindfulness and creativity in some degree. Um, Dana is going to walk us through a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. We've got a whole set of questions lined up. Um, it took us three years to, to become mindful in the show, and we don't want to lose any moment here. So Dana, then Natalie, then Sean, um, go ahead. Sure. Well, thanks for that lovely introduction, Kurt. Um, so my, my name is Dana Hendrickson. I'm an associate professor of leadership and innovation at Arizona State University. Um, and as um, Kurt was saying, that I, I, most of my research for my career has primarily focused on creativity. I have a particular interest in technology and creativity, but one of the things that I've loved about creativity is that it touches on so many areas of human life and thinking. So I've also dabbled in design and like I said, technology. And more recently in about the last five years or so, I've looked also at the connection between creativity and mindfulness, which came about through a personal interest that I developed in mindfulness as I was going through the stresses and rigors of the junior faculty tenure track process. Um, I took a ASG graduate course on mindfulness and, and learned a lot about it. Um, had a lot of opportunity to practice it and also started to explore in the literature the connection to creativity. And so that's where it threaded into my research interests. Um, and then in recent years through that, I've had a chance to work with and connect with um, Natalie and Sean through some more um, practice-based research and uh, through the work that Sean is doing in Balt School District. So um, should I turn it over to him to introduce himself? Well, let's do Natalie, just an introduction. We'll go to Sean, then we'll have Natalie do a, a demonstration or, yeah, Natalie. Okay. Hi, I'm Natalie Gruber. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I have certifications in mindfulness facilitation and art therapy, and I'm about two months away from graduating with my doctorate in educational leadership and innovation, and with Dana and Sean. I've been involved over the last few years with research, scholarship, and practice of mindfulness and creativity <laughs> in schools. And I'm really passionate about uh, the power of mindfulness that it can bring to support mental health and well being uh, for individuals in relationships and in communities like Crockett Elementary School. And congratulations for being on so many Tech Trends articles. That's, you know, a lot of students out there um, when they're graduating don't have much on their resumes. You've, you've probably got 12 or so articles. I don't know. I didn't, didn't count them, but there's a lot there. And there's a lot for anyone who's listening to read. Take a look at what they've done. Sean, you've been mentioned about five times so far. You want to uh, reintroduce yourself to all of us and what's going on at, at well, we'll get into later, but what's going on in general, what's going on at Crockett Elementary. Yeah, thank you. Sean Hannafin, proud principal of Crockett Elementary School. Uh, I've been here nine years, uh, was administrator in a different district for about 12 years, and then oddly enough, started my educational career here at Crockett, so taught here for eight and a half years, and had the chance to come back and had fallen in love with the school. Um, ASU grad, so I'm super excited about this as well, in early childhood. Um, over the last nine years, well, what, this, we're in our sixth year now uh, with implementing a mindfulness program or just kind of redesigning mindfulness program from year to year. 
for us um, because it changes. You know, it, it depends on who you are and how you start to implement mindfulness. And that's kind of where we started. And I'm sure we'll get into that conversation a little bit. Um, very unique school in Arizona. Um, large percentage of students that are in transitional housing and also students that are refugees from around the world. So again, thank you for having me. Very interesting. All three of you do interesting work. It's, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Uh, Natalie's gonna try something that we haven't done before in this show. And we're on episode 137, so it's about time we did. Uh, Natalie's gonna lead us in a, a meditational exercise, I believe, but I'll let you go ahead and uh, and do that. Yeah, great, thank you. And I thought maybe before I do that, we should define what mindfulness is, since we've already been talking about mindfulness a little bit. So mindfulness is essentially having the willingness and the intention to place our attention on the present moment and be open and curious about what our direct experience is. So one way we can do that, and we can try that here uh, in just a few moments, is we can pay attention to our breathing, which is always with us here in the present moment, or body sensations, those are two really common ways to practice focusing our minds and paying attention. So if you'd like to give it a try, I invite you to find a comfortable but upright position in your chair. So scooch in a way to make yourself feel comfortable and alert. And you can do this practice with your eyes closed, or you can just sort of soften and lower your gaze just so you won't be distracted. And we'll begin here by just taking a couple of breaths and noticing our inhale and exhale. And notice your whole body sitting here in the chair. You can gently scan your attention from the crown of your head down your face into your shoulders. Noticing the front and back side of your body, your torso, maybe starting with your chest, the rise and fall of your chest on your inhales and exhales. Bringing your attention down into your belly. And again, noticing the rise and fall of your abdomen as you breathe in and out. You can just sort of invite yourself to relax here. And then notice your seat in your chair, holding you upright. You can scan your attention down your legs and into your feet. And notice, maybe you can sense temperature in your feet, like they feel cold or warm. Maybe you feel tingling sensation or heaviness in your feet. Perhaps you can notice your feet connecting with the ground beneath you. And then we'll just put our attention into our hands. And again, we'll notice any heaviness, tingling, warmth, coolness. Touch. And then finally, you can just notice your breathing again. Rise and fall of your inhale and your exhale. And when you're ready, 
you can open your eyes and we'll end this meditation. We really don't want to end that. But I will ask if there are any tapes we can watch or buy anything in YouTube that we can watch. You have recorded any of these sessions? Oh, such a good question. I have. I've done some teaching at ASU that I've recorded um, that I'll be posting. Yeah. We'll Thanks. include the, that link in the, in the blog post. That Thank you. That. That'd be great. And so um, I guess we go to Sean right away here if we can. Um, how'd you come up with the idea of bringing curriculum, the curriculum of mindfulness into an elementary school, in particular Crockett Elementary School? What happened? Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, I, when I transitioned into the school, um, they'd gone through several principles in a, in a short time. So I think there was kind of some healing that needed to start with the staff first. Um, as we went through our first two years here, I just kind of listened to their needs and, and found out where they thought they were lacking. Um, one of the things they thought was they were knowing that their students came with a lot of stress to the school, being in the transitional housing, being from the country. Sometimes we had students that were in second grade that had been to three or four different schools before they even got to us. So how to build relationships. So as we were having conversations about that, we had also started some social services on how to support our families as well. And um, a lady that I was working with at that time had met a group for, uh, called Mindfulness First and brought them over to have a short discussion with us about what mindfulness was and how it could impact in the dream they had of kind of rolling it out within a school. Um, what I was able to do is get together with our superintendent, sit down and have a great conversation about why it would be impactful to our students and our teachers and our parents. Um, he knew that I was good at innovating and, and bringing new things to a school and kind of took the ball and ran with it. And uh, Crockett has been implementing it now for six years. And like I mentioned before, it's, it's a transitioning. It's consistently growing and, and changing for us. Um, but we've seen a lot of growth, both academically, behaviorally um, from our students. And we've seen a lot of teacher retention, which one of the things I credit that to is through the use of mindfulness, you know, they, they know this is a calm school. They know what to expect. They know to handle stressors that fall within the educational environment. Um, over the last couple of years, the world has changed and uh, education has definitely changed. And by having those abilities to kind of take some breaths and step back and realize what's happening right now, they've been able to develop questions that consistently increase and improve their classrooms and how they work with their children. So what was the station to take things to a district level, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it's broad and beyond Crockett Elementary. And what does that bode for you? Are you taking a, an additional role within the district at the same time as you are principal or are others being hired to implement this on a wider basis? And what's been the reaction? Sure. Um, yeah, definitely there's uh, a little more lifting for me in some areas uh -huh. when it comes to mindfulness in the sense that there's a lot of questions now. At first we had to answer them internally and, and to our superintendent. Now we have other principals that are reaching out and not only within our district, but around the Valley about how we've implemented and what we did. Um, the district is still partnered with mindfulness first. Uh, the big piece for us was, it wasn't top down. It was, let's find out what we need as a staff and we kind of had that conversation with mindfulness first. And then what we did was roll that out into the classroom. So instead of just doing a video presentation of what it might look like, teachers actually came into the classroom and worked with the students and the teachers to see and actually visually be a part of what was happening and be immersed in what a mindfulness program might look like. Um, that then allowed them to start to develop what it would look like in a natural setting within their classroom as opposed to me telling them exactly what it should look like. That then, now that we've moved into the district piece has developed, we've had conversations at the district level about what it should be and what it could be and, and what it will be as they start to develop. Now there's, a, we're a K-5 school now, um, we have a middle school. And so how do you implement mindfulness at two different levels? And now with Natalie's help, we're kind of rolling it out to the parents even more 
which is a unique story I'm sure we're going to get into in a little bit. So what's it like to, to corral all these teachers who have been doing other things until this point in time to recruit them, maybe to get some leaders within teams, sure. uh, finding those leader, who those leaders are, maybe some people are other people emerge over time to become the, the true leaders. Other people may get some training and maybe you you, you recommend types of professional development. Um, can you share with us a story or two? Yeah, definitely. Uh, again, it was it was back because we started organically. We said, what do we need? What do our students need? You know, it allowed us to develop what we're going to do. Um, within that, you definitely had teachers that stepped up right away and said, I, I can feel this making a difference in my classroom right away. And so they became our team leaders and became classrooms that people could go in and see it actually happening if the instructors weren't here. Um, with that, and because we've had 80 to 85 percent teacher retention year to year, we have this large staff of understanding it that understand it really well and able or are able to describe it to new staff members coming on board and are very open about come on into my classroom. I'm going to show you what it looks like. Um, our student council had asked if they could put it in our morning announcements. So part of our morning announcements every day now is a mindfulness session. And then usually when students return from PE, music, art, recess, anytime they make that transition, there's a short mindfulness session for the students or just, hey, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to breathe and get back into it so we can start the second half of our day. Um, what was the second part of the question? Any stories? Uh, Any specific stories? stories. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's been interesting to hear teachers talk about how they practice mindfulness and it's, it's everywhere. It's from, I'm driving home and I'm looking at the mountains and I'm, I'm being thoughtful about my day while, while being safe driving at the same time, but, um, to people that wake up in the morning and do maybe five minutes of breathing practice to people that sometimes decide not to go into the staff lounge, but instead, um, stay in their classroom and might do 30 seconds of mindfulness before they kind of exit, just because you need that time to reset and really think about, it's a reflection time. How did my first part of the day go? What do I want the second part to look like? Um, it has been interesting to have teachers sit through a training like Natalie just gave, and, and it just when you're done with that, after like a 30-minute session, they just feel so much more relaxed and, and ready kind of to take on the world that is their classroom. Um, you know, I consistently have teachers that have come down and talked about parents calling them and saying, hey, my kids are telling me that I need to practice mindfulness. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Which is really interesting to hear a five, six, seven-year-old telling an adult that, hey, you may need to breathe a little bit, right? I, I know things are rough, but it's been great to see. Um, we also have, uh, you know, events happening in our school. And so we've had people start to come in and um, see what's happening here. And we've had a chance to go someplace else. And I was at another school doing an observation and they were talking about mindfulness and how they've implemented it several years. And they said, do you know anything about it? And I said, yeah, we've actually been practicing mindfulness for six years at our school. And out of the blue, they just said, are, are you guys Crockett? <laughs> and I said, yeah, we're Crockett. So it, and it was far removed from our, from our site. So to hear them start to know about us and start to ask more questions was great because you can kind of share what you've done and they kind of take that ball and run with it. Chris is going to jump in here now, Chris. So there's a, actually a link between this episode and our prior episode where we had three leading universities, Harvard, Stanford, and MIT, talk about lessons learned from the pandemic in terms of teaching and learning, the forced shift to online learning. And the first thing that each of the three representatives said is, it really forced us to think much more about students' mental health than uh, we had been in the past, and that that's a really important lesson for us to take into the future. So it was um, good timing to have your follow on to that observation by them. <clears throat> I actually come to mindfulness from a little different direction, and I'm curious if you have thoughts about it. One of the things that I've studied is unlearning, because if you don't want to just do things better, but you want to do better things, 
if you don't just want to make the present system more effective, but you want to transform to a different system. One of the barriers is that people have to unlearn. They have to unlearn habits and they have to examine assumptions that, that are so baked in that they take them for granted and so on. Uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative was kind enough to fund a, a small workshop that some of us ran out in California a few years ago about unlearning where we brought together people who'd come to it like me, people from the neurosciences, people from cognitive science. And one of the people was a mindfulness expert. And basically what the point of view that she expressed, which made a lot of sense, is that if you can become mindful in the way that was demonstrated to us, you're kind of turning off a lot of your habits and assumptions and really opening yourself up to reinterpreting reality. And I'm wondering, Dana, if, if that's the link with creativity that you see, because you mentioned that you saw the two is related. Yes, absolutely. That's that's exactly a huge part of the link. Um, I started mindfulness, like I said, out of a personal interest and need, but my interest grew and wove into my professional life, which is very much focused on creativity when I started to see how the mechanisms by which mindfulness works and the, the things that it supports um, in our habits of mind and how we think and engage with the world are things that support creativity, which is um, a constant struggle and block that I would run into as I would be presenting work around creativity and have people say, well, that sounds great, but I'm not creative or, or but I can't do it that way because X, Y, Z is already in place. Um, that and my teaching is primarily with an ED, EDD program, which students are working to apply innovations in practice, come up with solutions to problems, but they would continually find solutions that are kind of tweaking the knobs of what already exists, which sometimes that can be good, but when you're really trying to innovate, it's, it's difficult. And it, it goes to the fact that in creativity and design, there's this mental thing that happens called fixation, which anytime you get a problem, if you're seated with information that's already there, you're going to keep working along those same lines. But where mindfulness kind of helps you to, over time, start to um, reduce a sense of judgment and start with kind of a beginner's mind, which Natalie can maybe talk a little bit more about too, the idea of sort of, start, sort of settling down your nervous system, all of the racing thoughts, observing your thoughts, but being able to let them go, it really gives you that space to be more creative because you have more of that sort of fresh mind. Um, you're less likely to be kind of impeded by some of these existing thoughts and assumptions or some of those fixation issues that happen so much when you're trying to approach a difficult problem or when you're trying to fix something in a system that already exists and you're getting sort of um, bounded by your assumptions or by the assumptions within the system itself. Um, mindfulness and meditation can just become a really effective, um, I don't want to say effective in the sense of it, I don't believe in using it for productivity, um, but, uh, but it develops really useful habits of mind that connect so well to creativity, reducing a sense of judgment, um, having a calmer, less anxious mind, so we're not so bounded by things, and really helping us to kind of see beyond what's already there and start with a fresh mind. So absolutely, Chris. So our one of our listeners, watchers over in YouTube, uh, Nicholas Peterson asks Natalie, this is a one school I taught at morning announcements featured meditation and mindfulness exercises every day. And many students began using it as a calming strategy when they went through challenges. Can all schools benefit from aspects of a mindfulness curriculum? And what would that entail, do you think? Have you thought about that? Well, that's a great question. Um, yes, I think anyone can benefit from mindfulness. Anyone can do mindfulness. And if we think about it in school settings or even in our everyday lives, just like we practiced here, when you practice mindfulness, you're actually changing the structures and functions of your brain. So your brain actually becomes more integrated. The different structures within your brain become strengthened in their functions. 
and they actually also have an easier time communicating with one another. So that's where we start to see some more flexibility, like Dana's talking about, kind of unlearning and um, being more willing to be spontaneous and create and try new things. And one of my favorite teachers likes to say that at one point in time, we didn't know that we should floss our teeth every day. Well, mindfulness could be for our brains in terms of what it promotes for brain resilience to what flossing our teeth is for our dental health. So anyone can practice this. It needs to be taught and learned and practiced and sustained as Sean is saying, in terms of continuously adapting the curriculum at Crockett. Um, but I absolutely think that uh, for individual health and resilience um, and promotion of mental health and optimal states of well-being, mindfulness could be practiced everywhere in all schools, and it could be a foundational training for uh, emotional health, really, and self-regulation. So it sounds like you've read the literature on this. Uh, if there's scientific studies that you think our, our viewers would want to read, send me those and I'll put them in the blog post as well. Because Dodzi is asking a question about the scientific component of the practice. So I'm assuming you've been up on a lot of that. Um, Absolutely. And I think that question was about the body scan and the connection between awareness of the body. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's promoting a sense of vertical integration within our brains connected to our bodies. And that particular practice has its own benefits to our self-awareness. And uh, I'd be happy to share. Thanks. Um, Young's got a question for you. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, this is uh, definitely a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing to do. Okay. So I'm just... But what I the question I'm going to ask uh, um, is not meant to be offensive, but could be okay. So don't take it that way. Uh, because you know, we we see a lot of lot of similar innovations. Meditation, right? It's one. Uh, you know, like in China, um, every school, every student has to go through. Uh, morning exercises every two hours. Sometimes they close their eyes in their class for five minutes. You know, you also read a lot of psychological, what I, I, I wouldn't call them necessarily scientific, you know, approaches to how to better your mind. You know, we know Buddhism has done a lot of in meditation, all of those things. So, so in my mind, mindfulness is a great term, but sometimes can be simply misused, you know, and when you require everybody to do the same thing, I just think there is a problem with that. So I would, my question really to all the three of you, both from a practice angle and from a research angle is that, uh, does it really benefit all students? And to what degree? If not, what else can you do? What if a student just said, ah, I don't want to be part of this. And I'm sure Sean, you are very aware Politically, there is huge resistance to social and emotional well-being, social and emotional learning. I'm sure you all are aware of. It. So, how do you deal with the political fights? And uh, so, but first of all, don't take that as offensive question, not questioning, but really a way to think about how to push this further. Any one of you or three of you, please. I don't know how you should start. <laughs> Um, yes, definitely. I agree with you that if we're telling them all to do the same thing, it's, uh, is it really working for them? Um, so in our conversation with our students, what we've done is given them a model of what it can look like. Uh, students have brought up other models of what they could do during that time as well. Um, some students like to close their eyes, some like to look down. Um, as long as they're not uh, distracting other students is kind of where we've left it. Um, we definitely had some conversations with parents about what we're doing at school and why we're doing it. Um, what we've been able to show them is academically how their child has improved since we've started this process and really kind of gone back to the science of academics as opposed to meditation and, and where that might take you because that's more of a personal choice. Um, 
the parents that we've practiced with definitely said we would like more of this. So it's been great to see. And I know outside of the universe of Crockett, there's definitely a larger conversation going on. Um, I sent Natalie an article today um, that we'll be discussing later uh, about where the state might be going with this as well. And so how how can we pivot or or change to make sure that our students are still getting the support that they need to realize what's happening in their moment? Because you're dealing with five and six and seven year olds sometimes that don't know how to process the world. Um, and as adults, we sometimes have to listen to them to find out how they are processing the world and how we can support them. So with us, we definitely allow students and teachers to kind of take it on themselves with a demonstration model what we'd like. Um, and I think Natalie can speak a little bit more or Dana can speak a little bit more about where it's going politically, I guess. I just wanted to kind of add it, I think to, um, that's a great question. And to add into Sean's, I think, what Sean was also kind of describing they've done at Crockett is the idea that I think mindfulness as a, a broad concept construct can be useful for anybody when you think about what it really means, which is aware, awareness of your thoughts, of your body, of your experience right now, so that we're not lost in the spiral of, of thoughts without realizing what's happening or lost in the spiral of stress or the negative self-talk. Um, but it doesn't mean that... Um, Mindfulness looks the same way for everybody. Mindfulness is something it's it's kind of I think I think of it as sort of a flexible structure where there's so many different practices. So there's particular different types. There's a whole range of meditation practices, which Natalie knows. Um, she's a like I said, a certified instructor. So she knows better than I, I do how many different possibilities for meditation that there are. But there's also ways of doing little mindfulness art activities. There's mindfulness um, body scans, mindfulness um, in terms of games. There's a huge range of different things. And I'm not a big believer in generalizability and the idea of taking a certain idea or a curriculum and just assuming that you can drop it into any setting or that it'll work everywhere the same. Um, but I think sometimes that idea of transferability, of thinking about some of the general ideas from something and, and letting people think about what it might look like in their setting, in their school, um, and sort of shape it in a way that works for them is oftentimes the most effective thing. So that each teacher, like in Sean's school, each teacher has kind of bought in through the time and the investment to mindfulness, but they all have different ways of thinking about it in their classroom. Um, and there may be some things that are common school practices around announcements and sort of this mindful culture, but what they do at Crockett might, would not be the same thing that another school would do. So I think taking that sort of general idea from a transferability concept in qualitative research rather than generalizability, which is more quantitative, and thinking about what you can use from this that would be beneficial for your context, for a particular student, for a particular classroom, for a particular school, and having that freedom and flexibility to kind of craft mindfulness in a way that it makes sense. So it's not sort of what you're describing, I think, um, which is that sort of regimented, everybody's gonna do this, um, throughout the day in this kind of lockstep, um, no choice, no autonomy kind of a thing, which gets a little more problematic. And Natalie, did you want to jump in with any of your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, as Sean was talking, I was thinking about uh, during a research observation at Crockett, I saw at one point a child, so at Crockett, they have hand signals that the children can actually initiate mindfulness and let the teacher know that they want to take a mindful moment. And the child can actually request it for the whole classroom when the classroom starts kind of seeming unsettled. And what I witnessed there was this incredible moment where a child recognized that the whole class was sort of emotionally dysregulated and needed to come back to their center and requested to take a mindful moment. And so the whole class took a breath, but I watched there was one child who seemed kind of unsure. He wasn't sure he was going to go for it and participate, but then eventually he joined in and it was sort of this sense of collective well-being. So there's this balance of like, can individuals, how much do, does one individual benefit more than the other? Well, here at Crockett, we're also talking about this sense of collective well-being 
which I think um, the idea that a child's looking out for the whole classroom and helping to regulate the whole class and not just thinking about themselves is really amazing. And I think what this speaks to is this greater sense of safety that you really feel on the Crockett campus. It has this very regulated uh, sense. So this individual regul self-regulation, but there's also collective self-regulation and a culture there where everyone's encouraged to participate. Not everybody has to, but everyone is encouraged. And it was sort of interesting to watch this kid, like not really be sure he wanted to partake in that mindful moment, but then eventually take some breaths with the class. So, And that autonomy too, that you spoke to Natalie and that they do so well, where how often can kids kind of say, teacher, we need this right now, or, or feel comfortable kind of just sitting on the margins and observing until they decide if they want to participate. So that idea of kind of keeping the, making sure that it's not super restrictive or uncomfortable or that anybody, any child or teacher is put in a position where it's like, you're going to do this. So good luck, but it's more used as a tool that they can shape to their needs and interests and have a little bit of autonomy. In the and how many opportunities really are there in our schooling for children to have a say like that? Well, I have a follow-up question, but you don't need to answer. Okay. The, because I, I know Chris has another question. Because I'm always um, mindful of any practice could have side effects. So, so uh, you know, like if it's become, um, so students cause, well, let's still have a mindful moment. I'm very concerned about the uniformity of that, that students is suppressed into a paradigm that, oh, we got a mindful practices, you know. Uh, when you do research, uh, you can always, almost of any practice, you can always find something good happening, okay? So I was just wondering, you would reflect on at what cost, you know, you gain this, you know, I call it like medical set. What did you lose? But you don't need to answer a question. I know Chris has more important question than what I asked you, but. Well, I'm, I'm fine if you want to answer it. I'm not in a hurry. So I, I don't know if I can speak to what we've lost, but I can speak to what we've gained. Um, we've gained more time on task in the classroom as the students are just kind of regulating themselves or, or supporting each other. It's not all top down from the teacher to the student, these kind of cases. Um, consistently, we have visitors come ask to visit Crockett. And when they walk across the campus, and I hope Natalie can attest to this, it's just a, it's a feel of calmness as you walk across. Um, as students come onto our campus, and we've had other schools request to place the child at our school because of the growth that they've seen we've had over the last couple of years, both with behavior and academics. Um, I, I guess what you lose sometimes is you might lose the ability to be the boss in the class all the time because sometimes students are learning to advocate for themselves, which has been great to see. And that's gone to starting new clubs, having conversations about um, being able to challenge each other when a student gives an answer. Um, so you may have lost some of the, I'm the boss in the classroom. And really what's kind of come on is students organically becoming more interested and engaged in the curriculum you're teaching. So I, I again want to take this in a little different direction. We've, we've talked about unlearning and creativity and the ways that mindfulness might enhance that. I may be construing mindfulness too broadly, but um, one of the things that my colleagues and I have done in our curricula, which are science education, ecosystem science learning, is to talk about deep seeing where you really just focus on the context around you and take in um, things that you wouldn't notice unless you had your entire attention focused. And I also have done some work with learning um, 
social emotional processes like negotiation and in negotiation you have to do deep listening because you really have to understand the other person's point of view to have a successful negotiation you have to do social perspective taking and so part of that is sort of setting aside yourself and your preconceptions about people and the sort of stereotypes that you might impose on the person you're negotiating with and just doing deep listening. So these are, are, I don't know if mindfulness is the right term because there are ways of um, not stepping away from the world into meditation, but in a way clearing yourself to step into the world and setting yourself aside but in a highly engaged way as opposed to a disengaged way. Is that still mindfulness? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think you're making a distinction between formal practice, which is how we opened this conversation, was the seated, we're closing our eyes, just focusing on what's happening internally within us. You're talking there more about relational mindfulness, bringing mindfulness into interactions, interpersonal interactions, and then informal practices where you're out in the world. You could bring mindful attention and awareness into your walking, your eating, your classroom environment. So there's both formal and informal practices, relational practices, and it's really this quality of attention that we're bringing, right? So the seed, the benefits of the seated practice is we are building the skill of self-regulation and seated practice is a really powerful and important way to sort of begin changing the structures and functions of the brain, but it certainly can be taken out into the real world and with great benefits too. Yeah. Yeah. And actually some of the mindfulness exercises that I've had a chance to do either through the ASU class that I mentioned or like at conferences um, that I find really helpful in a very practical real world way are some of those different types of things that help you think about, um, you know, you have meditation for cultivating that sense of awareness, a few minutes um, of, of that is a helpful practice. When you think about the practice as something for setting those awareness skills of mind, but there's a whole range of other things. And I can remember doing an active listening mindfulness practice where you were paired with um, another person you didn't know in the conference and took turns each telling of, you know, a story of your own choosing from your life about a challenging experience. And the other person had to listen as carefully as possible to everything you were saying and then practice um, rehearse, reciting it back uh, to you to see how accurately you or carefully you'd captured it. So that, I think that would be an example of that um, active listening is a, a, a kind of mindfulness practice. Um, when I first started I, I practicing mindfulness, I was taking an art class and I'm not a good painter. I have no background or skills in painting. So I was incredibly anxious about trying to do that. My sister's an artist um, and I'm not really. And I was struggling with not being able to sort of follow along or paint what was in front of me. And the instructor came over and said, well, stop trying to paint an apple, paint the colors, paint the maroon shades, paint the shadows, paint the light and the dark. And I really connected that to the mindfulness and trying to let go of some of that conceptual stuff and really observe what's in front of you. Um, and so I, I realized that like art can be a, a mindfulness practice if you're really doing it in that sort of intentional way. So I think what you're getting at, Chris, really kind of speaks to the range of different ways that mindfulness as a concept can play out and be helpful in engaging, engaging with the world. And that's not about shutting it out. It's really about active awareness of the world. Yeah, you know, and I, I think that framing it that way makes it easier to dodge some of the kinds of concerns that people have and that Yang is is raising as, as something that, that you may have to to overcome. That if you say it is important for mental health, it is important for calming down and for reflecting, but it's also a foundation for creativity. It's also a foundation for 
deep seeing and, and deep listening or whatever terms you want to use, uh, that, that may resonate with more people. Um, so just, just a thought in, in terms of the multidimensional use of, of mindfulness and the fact that it can go inward or it can go outward. Dana's unmuted. Do you want to say something? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think that's that's a common, as I started to learn more about mindfulness, I realized that's kind of a common misconception that's out there because of the nature of meditation practice and what we're doing, the, the quiet, the observing, um, that it's about like, I have to clear my mind and I have to force myself into this meditative state. It, and it's actually much more about just a deep awareness of what's going on. And if the thoughts are there, they're going they're going to be there. It's more about sort of being able to observe them carefully so that you're aware of what your mind is doing. And, um, and I think, yeah, that idea of positioning it as deep awareness, um, is, is true to what mindfulness is, but it's not necessarily how a lot of people might understand it if they are not as familiar, like at the level that maybe Natalie or Sean are. And, um, yeah, Kurt, I, I think you were trying to ask a question. Kurt. I, I, was I was just going to add, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, is that I think Chris is making a good point. I think mindfulness, for example, if people, if it gets to the idea about flow, a psychological process, you know, like you were describing about your, your painting, I think everyone may enjoy that in different moments. Because I think, you know, definitely meditation is one form, you know, you know, just that. But then you got kids, you know, with ADHD or some kids actually do enjoy that from sporting, from movement, from uh, throwing basketball, you know. Uh, I'm not against whatever you guys are doing. I just think there's a, a broader sense of mindful and mindfulness. And uh, then, of course, you know, I, I'm because of the, 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 the Chinese education system, because of uh, certain religious practices. So I'm, uh, I'm very mindful of any behavior requirement of students. And I know, Sean, you've seen good progress, you've seen all of those things, but I'm always mindful of that. A anyway, so that was just my comment. So I've got a comment and a question for Sean. Um, Sean, you want to go ahead before I, I ask you a question? Go ahead. No, I just, as, as you were speaking and Chris mentioned, you know, one of the things I kind of take away is we talk a lot about an event happening and do you need to talk to somebody, right? Something happened, you need someone to talk to. We have psychologists at school, we have social workers, we have therapists. Um, really what I've seen through mindfulness is our students becoming more proactive instead of reacting to what they might need. And really, Chris, I think you're right. Like they're starting to determine and our teachers starting to determine, hey, I see a problem starting to arise. What can I do to kind of curb that before it starts? And, and just like Yang said, I, we do have students that have ADHD and, and practice it a little bit differently. They may need to be stepping outside, you know, to shoot some baskets and those kind of things. But if you look at where it's gone within the sports world, I think you see athletes consistently being thoughtful about how they practice their trade and it's consistently made them better those students those the student athletes that you see or the athletes if they think about what they did and how they did it and sometimes they do it in the moment maybe at the free throw line they're consistently getting better and better at those things and if i can teach a student how to do that whether they're with me or not the, the biggest piece would be are they developing a tool that they can use no matter whether they're at my school or someplace else, and that's the biggest piece for me. And I've seen teachers, principals from other schools say, hey, can you talk to me a little bit about what you've done at your school? Because we're having parents come to our school and say, how come you don't have a mindfulness program? How come you're not helping our students learn to calm down and, and support themselves in the classroom? And it's been interesting conversations about what they can do and how they can start that organically again. And the military sometimes calls it act, ap, after action review or something like that. So they visualize what just happened and, and, re, and go back through. I have a comment and then a question for Sean or for all of you. Um, so the comment is, I had a high school teacher, humanities teacher named Mr. Rohde. And Mr. Rohde, uh, I mentioned him on one of our other shows, um, was really 
creative, innovative, and very open to alternative cultures and whatnot, and brought to us to a synagogue and brought a Swami into our high school. It was an option if we wanted to go to the auditorium to meditate with him, and I did. Um, it was fantastic, but I hear it's decades later, and I remember that one-off day of meditating in my high school and the impact that it had on me throughout my life. And imagine what it would have been like if I had, you know, a mindfulness curriculum for hundreds of days in school every year. I mean, just, you know, one day did make an impact uh, seriously on, on what happened. Um, just exposure and, op and opportunities and seeing different ways to, you know, live your life. Um, I want to go back to Dodsey's second question for, or I'm sorry, Edgar Leon's question for us from, from Puerto Rico. Edgar's been on a previous show. And, he, you know, he's talking about, you know, all the problems in Puerto Rico's had. And I'm just, I'm not going to ask his question exactly. I want to talk more about what's going on in Arizona, really. But, you know, in Puerto Rico's suffered from corruption, from earthquakes, from hurricanes, from power shortages, internet access issues, you name it, they've had it. And, you know, kids are having difficulty being pulled out for special programs who are, have P PTSD. Uh, it's just not working real well for many of them. Uh, making it a special program for those. But Sean, you've got a unique um, set of stakeholders there within your school district when you have students who have immigrated in or who are homeless. And I'm wondering, um, are there special things that are going on there because the clientele that you're working with, the people that you're working with, uh, that other people might learn a lot from and how are you are you seeing some unique things happen with the homeless children that may be in your school that other people could maybe implement? And the second question is, uh, do you see mindfulness having an impact on bullying behaviors and 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 off task and other kinds of disruptive behaviors? And really, I'll, any of you could talk about that after um, either Natalie or Dana after that. But Sean first. Yeah, and I'd love Natalie as an outside kind of eye to kind of talk a little bit about it. But um, with the transitional population that we have, the unintended comp, the unintended consequence of what we've been doing has been they they can stay within the shelter for a certain amount of time. And what we've seen families try to do is, even when they leave, try to stay at Crockett because of the connection they've started to build develop with us. Um, like I said, sometimes we have students that are in second grade that have been to three to four different schools. If we can allow them some time at the same place just to develop who they are and make that child feel calm, I think it's been a really great thing that we've seen. Um, we, tr we try to offer social services just like any other school does for sure. Um, but with that one, we've really developed this unique connection with the shelter that's really within our boundaries. Um, with the refugee students, you know, that's a much bigger one in that you're moving from a one country to a whole new country. And it's been unique to see them kind of come in and we've learned from them and they've learned from us at the same time. The, the biggest part there is the trust that I think we've built up between those families and the administration at the site. Um, and that the students really see, just because we're consistently talking to the parents, that the students really see that we're a partnership, that the teacher and the principal and the parent all talk together all the time, as opposed to sometimes they're going to tell mom something, sometimes they're going to tell dad something, and it might not always be the same. They don't really have the chance to do that because we're consistently sharing information with them and having a conversation with them about what we're doing and getting feedback from them. So I I, I think there's unique things we do, but part of it is just kind of who we've become over the last nine years as well. And it'd be fun to have, sit down sometime and talk to about our staff is sit down and talk about what Crockett does. So if someone new comes into this position, there's an understanding of where we've been and kind of where we've gone over the last nine years. And I think Natalie has, or Dana has some research to share with us and we'll put it on the website as well. And, and um, maybe she'll talk about it here in a second, but I want to just make a, a second comment is my high school was very progressive that I, that I mentioned. It was Nathan Hale, West Dallas, Nathan Hale High School, where Chris probably realized we're all on the west, near west side, but no longer is. Now my high school is where Tr Donald Trump holds his rallies when he comes to Milwaukee and goes on national, national television. So <laughs> it's changed <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, Dana. 
Well, actually, I'm, I was gonna I was gonna suggest that um, maybe Natalie would like. I, I know we're we're we running up a little bit on time. I wanted to give her a moment to share a little bit about the work she's doing with parents. I'm happy to share some of our publications around mindfulness and creativity and some of that. Um, and if there's time, we can circle back to me. But I, she's got some really exciting stuff happening with parents that I thought would be at, that's at Crockett, too, that I thought would be really interesting for people um, to kind of connect with. And we just got a couple of minutes, two, three minutes. Yeah, go ahead, Natalie. Thank you. Yeah. So this actually really connects with what Sean is talking about in terms of there being constant communication and connection at the school and kids feeling safe not only because they're learning how to regulate themselves, but because they're in this environment where the adults are regulated. And when people are more regulated, they actually have an easier time with social connections. So we know, so Dana and I got introduced uh, to Sean and his wonderful work through a, a research project. We're involved in evaluating the Bolt School District taking their mindfulness uh, program district-wide, the, the impact of that and dynamics of that. And so when I heard that there was no parent program that existed yet, I was really excited and delighted because my training as a therapist is with children and parents. And I know from being a mental health specialist that children's emotion regulation, and that's what we're really talking about here. And that's the reason Crockett took on this mindfulness training was to help children learn how to regulate. But where children learn how to self-regulate is at home. So, and it's in connection with their primary caregivers, maybe their parents. So I actually, for my dissertation research, have taught parents at Crockett Elementary School how to practice mindfulness. And I did my teacher training for mindfulness at UCLA. And UCLA has developed an evidence-based six-week curriculum where we meet for six weeks for two hours each week. And we practice and learn about mindfulness in all areas and aspects of life. So we are learning mindful walking and eating and sitting and listening and talking and breathing and formal practices. So what I have found through my research, and we're going to be actually at Crockett this week, Dana and I with Sean, sharing these results and introducing an art therapy model that I think would be very relevant to the question about how to support students in Puerto Rico with the multiple challenges. Um, and we can include Dana and I have a video of that um, model, walking through that model uh, that we can share as well. But what I found through my research with parents is parents learned how to practice mindfulness. They started practicing it sometimes even automatically in their daily lives. I taught them different practices like stop and rain, these different practices that you can bring to your everyday experiences. And they strengthened their sense of emotion regulation. They felt happier. They were more aware of their connections with other people. And in moments of difficulty with their children, they changed their discipline strategies. And so without it, it's a little bit more complicated than what we have time for, but essentially discipline turned into learning opportunity, more awareness, and they had more access to, if we're going to talk back about the science of this, their prefrontal cortex, where they could think things through and decide more how they want to handle a situation with their children in a way that instills internalized learning about their behavior and awareness about themselves. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about using discipline to help children learn to self-regulate because they carry this learning forward. And so it really exciting. We saw a statistical significance in children being happier, less worried, and easier to console just by parents learning how to practice mindfulness. And this was not a parent mindfulness class. This was a mindfulness class for parents. So they were not learning to bring mindfulness into their day-to-day -day interactions with their children, just into their everyday experiences. And it transformed the parents, 
their children and their relationships with yep, each other. Sounds so, great. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I'm sure you've got much more content to share with us, but but Dana, we'll get you and Edgar connected and you can maybe uh, share stories for people in Puerto Rico. I appreciate Lisa Grace's comment, who's a teacher at Crockett, apparently. She's watching in the in the YouTube channel. Thank you, Lisa, talking about she's encouraging her students to practice awareness as they need to use it um, in their own time. And they appreciate walking together, breathing together, noticing the environment and getting ready to focus on their learning. Wonderful stuff today, just wonderful. Thank you, Dana, thank you, Natalie, thank you, Sean. Um, sorry, we didn't get you a chance to, to, to say um, about your, talk about your research, Dana, but, but we'll share it. A lot of that I think came out in some of the things that um, were being shared about Crockett and Baltz. And um, and I we have, Natalie and I have several papers and um, I can share some of those with you if you wanna put those out. Uh, I'm sure you're so prolific. I'm sure you have many papers. Chris is gonna have to introduce the next show again. Thanks so much. And we're excited um, about the next show, episode 138. Uh, we've been doing a series of shows about India, and this is another that adds to all the interesting initiatives in that very large and complex country. This is about experiential learning in India. We're looking at two initiatives, one of them dealing with making, one of them dealing with VR, <clears throat> that are very thoughtful about what they're doing with experiential learning. And you should be mindful about the fact that next week's episode is at 10 a.m. because of the time zone difference with India as opposed to 5.30 p.m. Mm -hmm.